All right, well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, my name is Matt. I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce Jonathan Cohen, who has uh, been doing woodworking and furniture building for uh, 40 years now. Um, I actually met Jonathan a few years ago when I moved into uh, my house in Wallingford. He uh, lives across the street. And, you know, we were chatting, you know, talking about what do you do. And, and uh, you know, he says, uh, well, I build furniture. And it just so happened my wife and I at the time were thinking about getting some new furniture. And we said, well, would you be at all interested in, uh, you know, building a media center for us? And, and uh, so, you know, after spending some time talking about this, you know, we met at a coffee shop and, you know, discussed his work and everything like that. It was just fascinating learning so much from him about, you know, the process and the artistry of building furniture from scratch. It's not something I've ever thought about. You know, my my experience with furniture building uh, is mainly IKEA. Uh, and, uh, you know, over the course of several months, you know, it was amazing to watch this uh, this massive uh, Wingate Wood media center that uh, Jonathan built for us materialize and get to see it through all the stages of its development because his workshop is his garage in, Wall in Wallingford. Uh, and then, then came the, uh, the fateful evening when we got to uh, bring it over to our place and, uh, you know, we, how are we going to get it over there? Well, I guess, uh, you know, we can kind of put it on this dolly here and we go over to pick the thing up and it weighs like literally 800 pounds or something. I mean, we, we could barely lift it, uh, let alone get it up the stairs. We nearly destroyed it trying to get it into my living room. Uh, but fortunately it survived and it's there to this day and uh, getting plenty of abuse from the kids. Uh, so it's uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Jonathan, and um, I guess as we go along, if you have questions, let me know, and I'll I have a mic. We're recording the talk. We're going to put it externally as well as part of the Google Tech Talk series. So uh, let me make sure I give you the microphone so that your question can get onto the video. Thanks, and Jonathan, take it away. Thank you, Matt. Yep. Hello. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I actually don't do this for a living, so if it seems a little clumsy, bear with me. Although I will say I taught at the University of Washington over here in the design department, and I do talk about my work occasionally, but this is a rather intimidating audience. I'll, I'll try and manage it. Um, I was thinking about this last night, and I was thinking, you know, you see all these guys getting trophies or going out in front of everybody, and they always say, it's an honor for me to be here. And I think, maybe it's just me, but I think what they're really thinking is, it's an honor for you people that I'm here. <laughs> but, but I don't think that's the case here. I, I really do feel quite honored that you guys would take the time and, and everybody out in video that would listen to, to what I have to say because this is my life's work. Um, Matt overshot the runway by a couple of years. It's been 38 years, but um, this is what I've done my whole life. And interestingly enough, I didn't really plan to. I'd actually planned to go back to law school because I like to read. Um, but I had this sort of, I don't know if the word is epiphany, but I had this vision um, of myself going and getting to law school if I could, pass the bar if I could, get hired if I could, and then they were going to stick me in this little corner office, right, new, new guy, and I'd have an oak for Mike a desk, and I said, no, I'm making one out of ebony and silver, and then I figured the next thing is the clients start coming and say, well, I don't know what you know about the law, but could you make me a desk? So I figured I'd just take the shortcut and start making, <laughs> making furniture. That, that's, that's actually true. That's how I became a furniture maker, and I, and I, um, I really thought it would keep me interested for two or three years. I mean, I can't imagine there's anybody sitting here right now who isn't pretty jacked up and pretty excited about what you do. It's, 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 it's brainy, uh, invigorating stuff. And I thought this might have that effect on me for a couple of years, but we just told, uh, said it's about 38 years, and I still find it kind of amazing. And I hope that passion will come through. I hope to infect you with a little bit of it. but. Uh, the other thing I did before I came down, I thought a little bit about just some words I wanted to say. Immediately, I'm just going to go into showing pictures of the work. And I encourage you to interrupt me, or at least let me know you'd like to say things. And everything's on the table. In fact, there's some things here on the table for you as well later. But everything's on the table. What a perfect analogy for a euphemism for now. You can ask whatever you want. You can ask if I was wearing Crocs. You can ask if I had just won the Super Bowl. You can ask what a piece costs. The questions tend to be a slightly more of a technical nature, and I love those, and why I chose the wood, what the wood, any, anything you want to ask, the names of it, it's all fair game. But I did want to read this one little blurb I wrote, because for me, uh, it really is about, let's see if I can do this, uh, to me, it really is about the wood. There's a piece of ebony with silver inlay in it, and what I really hope you take 
from this or, or you enjoy about this is not really that much about me, but I hope you will get what Matt seemed to either grasp or already have or grasp immediately like he tends to. Just this sort of, in fact, over the years, then this is kind of vulgar to some people, but I mean it to be very visceral. I call it the WTP factor, and that stands for wet the pants. That means if you walk in and, and you don't do this, there's really no purpose in hiring me because you can go to Ikea, as Matt said, or you can even go to one of those middle-class furniture stores that mark the heck, that marked up the prices horrifically and don't give you much. But if my choice of woods and materials and maybe a little bit of my design working with it doesn't make you do this, there's, there's really no point. Luckily, there's enough people that do this that it's been good. But it's really about the wood to me, and I wrote maybe something of an homage. And I'll, I'll read it real quickly, if you'll permit me. Wood is an imperfect material, which to my way of thinking makes it the perfect material. It is far more fickle and tempestuous than either metal or glass or clay, for example. These tend to have somewhat predictable tones, rather foreseeable densities and movements, and when working with them, nearly calculable results. A piece of steel produced in Pittsburgh is nearly indistinguishable from a piece made in Peshawar or in Prague. But wood, even if it comes from the opposite side of the same tree, often varies greatly in hue and in density and in temperament. That word temperament will come back. The other materials are like a companion who is, well, companionable. But wood is like a dance partner with flashing eyes and wildly athletic movements who can explode off the walls and then mellow into soft balletic movements. Working in those other inert materials leaves one satisfied. With wood, the end result is much more akin to exaltation. Just ask yourself, would you prefer to dine with someone special over cold glass or hard steel or a brace of clay all rolled out by a machine? Or would it be more sensuous experience over silky smooth, warm, sumptuously figured timber, hand planed and polished to perfection? People are like wood, infinitely variable, and therein lies the beauty. But this is just my objective opinion. Um, I actually don't need that at this point. So if anybody would, for some reason, like those, you're welcome to them. And other than that, I've got no prepared notes or anything I need to say, except for really to answer any questions and hopefully um, explain articulately what we're looking at here. Um, let me do this. So I start generally when I talk about my work. I am not a cabinet maker. This is not a distinction that I can imagine makes, makes any difference to anybody but me. Cabinet makers to me make cabinets. Cabinets are generally by their very nature boxes. And I'm thinking, holy cow, 38 years of making boxes. I, I tend to like furniture pieces, which to me are more like desks and chairs and, and uh, um, uh, anything that's not a box, really. And a lot of guys who can do one can do the other, but um, I, I like to think of myself as a furniture maker and perhaps even a furniture maker slash designer. That's my training. I studied graphic design at Cornell centuries ago, and it sort of morphed into this. But the, the nicest thing about uh, tables for me, and especially small tables, is they, have, they make the least demands. They, they are, oops, sorry, I should probably start off with one of them. They make the least demands. They need to do the, li the least functionally. I don't have to stuff napkins or uh, toothbrushes or, or, or silver or anything or, or ink blotters into these things. They, they're really just a surface that you can work with. And the smaller the surface, the more freedom I have as a designer. And I bring this piece up first because, um, one, I'm fond of it. Two, um, and you'll probably hear this reference during the discussion today about calligraphy a lot. I trained as a calligrapher and actually taught for a while. And so I, I didn't plan it this way, but I realized as I designed that to me, a lot of my work has um, calligraphic elements in it, which I, I'm delighted they, they showed up like this. This table is actually called the Halberg Wing Table. It's the first of only, I've probably built 500 pieces in my, my career. This is one of, I think, three, perhaps four pieces that actually has a person's name attached to it um, for a lot of reasons. He's a very, he was a very, very wealthy collector, uh, and he, he 
asked for a piece. In fact, if I can digress for a minute, it's kind of a funny story because I was about 23 or 24. I had just opened my studio when this man called me, and I knew who he was, um, uh, and I knew how important this commission could be to my career. And I did something which I don't characteristically do. I froze up. <laughs> I was a little overwhelmed with how important I thought this piece and this man might be. And I just couldn't come up with anything for a while. And uh, finally one day I said, you know something, Jonathan? That's like not even standing up at the plate. Sorry. Sorry for the sports analogy. But I mean, you're not even swinging for crying out loud. So I did something that to this day I can't explain. I actually pick up the phone. Remember the kind with the little pigtails on them? And I called him and I said, Mr. Howard, this is Jonathan. He said, how is my table doing? He's not only a big guy, he was a big guy. Um, and I said, oh, it's great. I've got something right here I, I think you'll like. I had nothing. I had no notes in front of me. I had no ideas. I don't know why I said it. I just, I said, he says, great, bring it down tomorrow and we'll take a look at it. And, and I have a pho photographic memory. I can tell you the shirt I was wearing that day. It's about 35 years ago. And I remember I had the phone to my right ear. And as I lowered the phone down, what does that motion take? Uh, three, te three quarters of a second, something like that. In the three quarters of a second from my ear to the cradle, I saw, I saw the table exactly like that. <coughs> it, it just, I'm not saying it's a great design or not, but that's what I got from it. And uh, he saw it, and uh, he liked it, and I built it. Um, the original one here is made out of imbuya which is a South American wood, which is quite beautiful. They call it South American walnut, but it's much more mysterious. And then the three risers are made out of ebony. This is the only table I've made like this. I've made the wing table several times, but I make it the way I prefer to, which is I make it out of a black, ink black wood, like wenge or East Indian rosewood, uh, wood like that. And then the three risers are in white holly, and they're made to look... I mean, most people's walls and most of their houses are white. It's made to look like the top is just floating with no support. And the interesting thing about this piece, well, a number of things, but um, that piece, I, I realized over the course of the next 10 years, that piece uh, resulted in about almost a million dollars worth of commissions. Nobody ever saw the piece. It went to his house. That photo, which is in a portfolio here, resulted in about a million dollars worth of commissions in the next years. I know those aren't Google figures. <laughs> But those are Jonathan Cohen fine woodworking figures. It was, and, and again, not the money really. It was just this, you know, as a person who designs and signs and puts the names, the reaffirmation or the affirmation of the, the respect that I thought came from it was very heady stuff for me. And most of my major clients in the last 25 years have referred to that piece as, as the one that, that interested them in my work. So I'm pretty fond of that. Um, any, does anybody have any questions at this point or any about the way things were curved or woods or things like that? Oh. I'm really curious how you got the, the slight bend on the two ends. Well, that's actually about 50% of the work in the whole table, that bend. I, I bend almost everything I can. I don't think it will take most people very long. And with this group, with the firepower, the intellectual firepower, you probably figured it out before you saw the photos. But I don't particularly like straight lines. Uh, in much of what's written about me or that I write, I talk about the elements being straight lines pulled into tension. So, for example, this is not straight. This has got about five-eighths of a bend in it. The top line is straight, and the bottom has the slightest, slightest... I don't use the word curve. I don't like curve. Curve, to me, is heavy-handed and goopy and obvious. And these are, like I say, it's almost like the material was elastic, and I pulled it and it stretches. And that has a bunch of interesting effects. One is it takes twice as much time to do it. But mostly the pieces become, in a most subliminal way, they become more organic. Because what you see here is when things are thinner here, they are by their nature generally thicker here. And that's the way the human body's built. That's the way trees are built. That's a lot of the way things in nature are built. They're built where you put more mass and strength where you need it. You don't need it in certain places. And so again, these these are not too hard to miss that they're they're bending. They're also tapering a quarter of an inch. And you'll see other pieces where I bend and taper because I just love this sort of, you know, almost balletic, I'm on point kind of feel to it. So, um, uh, repeat your question for me so I make sure I answered it. <laughs> it was mostly uh, how you did that. Oh, uh, the one curve here. Technique. And to me, just, I, I think in my portfolio it says, and I've always used this phrase, I don't like squatty, earthbound furniture. 
I, I like to be uplifting and light. And to me, just to put those almost wing tips in it and to lift it was the way to do that. And what I do actually is I take the chunk of wood, if I can get a board as wide as the table. And these tables are around 12 or 13 inches deep. It's, you can see the, the proportions and the scale of it straight on, but the top is only 13 inches wide. And I take my bandsaw and I tighten it very carefully and I sharpen the blade and I make one cut just by eye down. In fact, the saw blade is doing this perpendicular to the picture and I just cut, make that cut. And then I take my hand planes and the most influential tool in my life has been a plane called a compass plane. I'm guessing most of you know what a hand plane is. This one actually has a curved sole and you can actually turn a screw and you can change the arc and, and from concave to convex in the same plane. And I use, it's over all my work. So that actually, I take a curved sole plane that has to be razor sharp and super accurate. And I just come down and come and plane this down here. It's all done by hand. 90% of what I do is by hand or more. Uh, so let's go back. No. Okay. And I'm going to go through these a lot quicker so I don't waste your time too much. And then that's a detail of that same piece. It was supposed to have sort of a pottery, sort of almost archaeological feeling. That's why I chose that wood. Um, oh, Matt said I can do this. Um, nope. <laughs> I'll get it. I promise. He's a cursor. Okay. This is just another little, what I call, wisp of a table. Just these tables tend to fill beautiful little spaces. Your hallway is a little bit too wide. This kind of narrows it down and defines it. This, they're called sofa hall tables in my in my lexicon. This is just um, there's another version of the wing table done for the son-in-law of the original client. This is done in Bubinga, and Bubinga is one of my favorite woods to use. You'll see a lot of it. It's sort of a blood red wood with more life than you can imagine, and it weighs. Pretty similar to what a piece of marble of the same size would weigh. Whenever I hand a person a piece of bobing, the reaction is always, oh my god, and it drops. It's got this incredible weight to it, and it's a beautiful wood. Um, and besides, I love to say the name. Bobinga. Thought of naming my first kid Bobinga, but I didn't. <laughs> uh, this is one of a series I did that were tables that were supposed to have sort of an Egyptian feel. This is made out of East Indian rosewood, which Matt and I have talked about is because of the Martin Guitar Company is now embargoed in this country and you have to be all uh, certificated and so forth. I actually have a little bit of it I bought 20 years ago, so <laughs> if it interests you, let me know. Um, sorry. This is another table that had kind of an interesting um, boost in my career and generated a lot of interest. Matt actually has a version in Cherry. It's called the Deer Leg Table. Um, to the fellow who asked about the curve in the, the top of the, one, the wing table, the legs here seem to intrigue people to try to... Um, it's, most of my work is not meant to be secretive or um, elusive. It's meant to be incredibly non-elusive, but, but you know, understood. But that leg seems to confuse people, and when we're off the record, I'll tell you how I made it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I can say it on the record, it doesn't really matter. Um, there's a detail of the leg in, in Buya, the other wood I sometimes make it in. This is a, a piece I enjoy. This is called the Signature Table, and it's uh, uh, Macassar ebony with silver. And uh, very similar to the leg, Matt, Matt's piece, you'll see that this piece comes down. You can see the bend, and if you notice, it also tapers. And the combination of the bend and taper make it quite difficult to make. Um, but I think the result is just so much more dynamic and and move um, and pretty. Um, that's called the signature table, just because that that leg looks a little bit like the J in my name, Jonathan. It's not an ego thing. It's well, maybe it is. Um, there's a full version of it. Again, sort of a wisp of a table. These are all these early tables. They're all 12, 13 inches wide, and they come in in a hallway, and you throw your mail on it or or you need some space behind the sofa. And that's what these were for. And then this was just, I took the, the mold that I built that with and thought, what would I do if I just played with the curves in there and I made a little sort of wall hung desk. That's Zebrano or Zebra Wood. Some bedside tables, again in Bubinga. And I started experimenting at one point with lacquering because I felt as much as wood gives you a palette you can't match with any other material. I mean, there, almost nothing you'll ever see in any of my slides is, is stained. People say all the time, I never stain. 
there's so many beautiful kinds of wood that you work in the wood that you think gives you the color palette you need. However, I did lacquer these, that greenish, it's not a good photo, but those are supposed to be teal green. And I started experimenting with color in it, but I didn't stay with it very long. There's a, and I like the detail shots. This is that um, zebra wood wall shelf, just showing the dovetails. Little coffee table in spalted maple and solid maple. There's a detail for um, a, obviously a different version of the wing table. And you can do all kinds of things with wood just by turning the cut. You can take a tree and cut it a certain way, cut it and, 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 and then consequently turn it and cut it on a different bias change the complete nature of the wood, the strength of it, the appearance of it, even the cost of it. So this is what I like to call architectural maple. Very thin pinstripes, quarter stone, very, very stable and quiet. And that's just to contrast what's going up above, because a table that was built all like this would be like three main courses on your plate. It might be a bit much. So maybe this isn't the way to describe it, but maybe this is the main course, and these are the vegetables, and this is the starch. It's just trying to balance and it's not just done for visual reasons, it's done for structural reasons. When you get highly figured woods like this, they tend to be unstable and difficult. And then when you have all the strength of the table in this mortise and tenon joint blocking this leg, you need the strength, so I chose that wood. Little t it's actually four nestling tables I did for a collector on the east side, black figured black walnut. That's the detail. Um, I'm going to wait for a more description until I get to a better picture of this, but again, that tabletop is called spalted maple. And I'm not sure, has anybody ever heard that term, spalted? Oh, you have heard it. You have also? And you know what it refers to. It, it's a fungal growth that's, that's proceeding, growing into the tree. It can happen, as far as I know, in any species. I've seen it very rarely in walnut. 98% of what I've seen happens in maple. And it happens out here on this coast, much more on the east coast. Um, in woodworking and in, and, and in wood, people often make the mistake of saying, oh, it's east coast maple or west coast this. Those names mean nothing. You're, when you're talking about east coast maple, you're talking about uh, Acer saccharinum, sugar maple. It's a species that's much denser than the one that grows out here, which are the big leaf maples or Acer macrophyllum. And I have had so many generally comical, sometimes a little pissy, uh, pissing match kind of arguments with people about what the wood is called. And if you use common names, you're in trouble because they don't mean that much, although we all use them. But this is spalted maple. And I think I'll hold off for just a second to a, a prettier picture of this. And I'd like to talk to you about it a bit more. By the way, the word spalted, I, I thought it came from, um, I looked it up, I Googled it actually, which is what we all do about anything when we're feeling inept. Uh, and it said spalt. It comes from a German word, gespalt, and it means to divide. And I thought that's kind of cool because the wood sort of divides up. That's not the derivation, actually. It comes out from the, uh, an old English word, spoilt. Like we used to use for, I think they're called participles when you end the word in ed in the past tense. That's a participle. So uh, <coughs> walk, walked, spoiled. We, we say spoiled, but a lot of our words in, in English in the turn of the century were, were ended with a T. We still do that familiarly with words like kneel. We don't say kneeled. We tend to say knelt. And spoiled became spoiled. And the old guys, when they had whatever they had in their mouth, chewing tobacco, eh, this damn tree spoiled. And it became spalted from there because the tree was rotting. I, I kind of like that. Yeah. Let me get you, let me get you on, the, on the mic. How do you choose uh, the type of wood for a certain design? That's a wonderful question. Thank you. Um, I'm not really hoping you'll ask questions, so you'll um, I'll be able to answer your question. I'm asking so you hope you'll remind me of all the things I forget to say. Thank you very much. Choosing woods is interesting. Um, as you might expect for someone who's had his hands all over wood for more than 40 years, and, and actually much, much before that, woods have personalities. I, I can pretty much guess that with all the people in this room, there's not a whole lot of overlap on, on, on the ways you see things and taste things. And wood is, they have their own flavors, if you will. That's, again, what I was pointing out about clay and metal and glass. I know there are different kinds of glass. 
not many. And there's, but wood is is not only variable for the thousands of species, but each piece. I started off when people came to me trying to get a feeling for you know where this piece would live. If it left, lived in a very closed room, dark woods would not be a good choice. You'd choose lighter woods to lighten the room. If the whole room was glass, maybe you'd choose a darker wood to anchor the piece in there. But I used a term that frustrated me very much. For some reason, I don't know, but, but woods tend to fall into three categories in terms of colors. Um, there are obviously variations, but there are what I call the blonde woods, which are maple, uh, these are the ones you're probably most familiar with, maple, birch, oak, elm, ash, um, birch, these sort of beigeish more than blondish, but light blondish woods, we call, I call them the blonde woods. There's a smaller category in the middle which I call the redheads, and they tend to be things like cherry is probably the most common, cherry, mahogany, bubinga, very warm woods. And I use the word warm on purpose because that's what they feel like in your room, and that's very nice in a bedroom or a place like that. And the brunettes, and the brunettes are the most common, least expensive is the American one, which is black walnut, but then you get into ebony, and you get into wenge, and you get into East Indian rosewood, and there's a couple interesting things about those. They tend to go in price by color. Almost all the blonde woods are the least expensive ones. Um, the redheads, like uh, mahoganies and cherries, are sort of middle-priced. And most of the really dark woods, I can't think of too many exceptions, most of the really dark woods are really expensive. So the price comes out a little bit when I first talk to a client, because unless you're someone like Matt Welsh, that's got to be an element. <laughs> that's got to be an element. It certainly is for me. Um, but mostly the feel in the room. And I, and I tell people, I used to tell people, think of as you start to see this piece come in your mind, as I'm starting to see it come in my mind, um, I don't generally encourage people to take, and I'm going to offer these to, to any of you who would like to take when I printed this a while back, and I know nobody uses print for, for information, but here's a folio that I, I made of my work, which I'm kind of proud of, and I have some if you'd like to take them. But I refer to them as blondes, redheads, and brunettes. And someone pointed out to me that it was kind of sexist, and I said, how is that sexist? I'm a brunette. I mean, he's a blonde. I, I didn't get that. It wasn't meant to be anything sexual. It was just meant to sort of familiarize things. But I tend to think of them in those three groups. Um, and then if you were talking to me or someone else and we were talking about a piece that didn't exist yet and you were going there, I would start to say, think of the woods in those general groups. Think of the space you think this is going to go, your bedroom, a deck, uh, your office, and think of the effect you want this piece or the feel you want this piece to have when you walk in. You walk into your bedroom and it's got a just a polished, beautiful, sensuous piece of cherry there and, and a beautiful bedspread on it. And that cherry bed is probably going to give you a bit of a warm feeling. That's what it does for me. A blonde wood might be more technical and quieter and, and the dark wood is going to be sort of mysterious and, and powerful. And I, I don't actually design with a pencil. I have no drawings of my work. That that raised eye look that you gave me is exactly what I get from my students every time. They always say, where are your drawings? And I say, there aren't any. Um, I, I like people to look inside and sort of see what they think this piece they might like. And I don't mean necessarily as a client, even as someone who might want to build a piece. Um, which makes me lead into, I don't draw. Um, my father was an architect and he drew, but I'm not an architect, I don't draw. People say, well, how do you, how do you, how do, you, how do you design what you're doing? And I said, well, I don't draw because when you draw, you're looking generally at a piece of white paper, uh, a brunette, I mean a blonde, it, with graphite, some kind of graphite or ink running across it. And I've never seen a piece of furniture that small, two-dimensional, pure white with a graphite outline. So the drawing to me doesn't even come close. And it's just too small anyway. They said, well, why don't you do a full-scale drawing? And I said, that's just a bigger version of the same thing. <laughs> And then the students would always ask, well, why don't you, um, why don't you do a mock-up? And I said, well, my woods are things like ebony and wenge and, and, and woods like this. They're quite sensuous. They don't look like what you make a mock-up of, which is you go to Dunlumber and get a piece of two-by-four and you make a mock-up. It's quick. It's cheap. Um, I, sort of, I sort of dare you to sort of make a mock-up of that without using wenge and mahogany uh, or the ebony piece. And they'd say... Well, why don't you do a full-scale markup 
a mock-up with the wood you're using? And I said, I do. And then I sell it. <laughs> <laughs> I see the piece, I make it. Anybody who I've ever built for has the right, 50 years after they received the piece, to say they've changed their mind. Nobody's ever sent a piece back. <laughs> Maybe they're too polite, I don't know. Um, so that's the process. Yes? Uh, what are your thoughts on using uh, additional coloring on the woods, you know, different stains? It looks like most of what I've seen here is you know, pretty natural. Yeah. There is only one piece in the entire series, uh, well, in, in my oeuvre, my, the, in my work, there's only one piece that I stain, um, and that is, um, I could go back to it real quickly, <laughs> I think. Um, scrolling, or not. No. Well, the wing table, the, the dark, dark wing table. That, to get the black, is very hard and to get the stability out of it. So I actually make it out of mahogany and I dye it black because I want the jet black like in the ink, like calligraphy, and to offset the white. It's the only piece I make that I, that I dye. As I said, there are so many, um, so many tones and colors. Like I said, as I also said earlier, on, it varies from one side of the tree to the other. You can get incredible color ranges. I'm pretty familiar with the material after all these years, and I can almost always find. If someone said, I absolutely want this to have a purplish hue, I'd, very, I'd consider dyeing it for them. It's just it, it's come up so infrequently. It's not part of the way I, I normally think. I'm not opposed to doing anything that I think is not disrespectful to the client, the wood, or anything else, but I don't think that is. I'd, I'd be willing to do it. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try. It. I'm trying, but it kind of always goes back. Am I too close to it, probably? There's no way to mute it, unfortunately. So we'll see if that helps. Yeah, another question about finishes. Um, so what are your thoughts on you know, kind of plastic, like varnish finishes versus uh, waxes and polishing and oils? Well, um, if you use the word plastic, I'm immediately opposed to it. I mean, <laughs> again, you can go back to the C above where it says glass, steel, and clay. I don't. There's anything. My material and my work is anything but plastic, but, but at least in that sense of the word. Um, my finishes are all hand-rubbed oils. I have a friend who's taken over most of my more dining table-y, coffee table things, which take more of beating than, let's say, a chair. If you think about it, really the most contact you have in the chair is your hands, and actually uh, you can actually put no finish on a chair because your hands will oil it. Dining tables see wine glasses, and I don't know about Seattle, but in some parts of the country, cigarettes and you know things like that. And they need a tougher finish. So I have a friend who's been working for me for about 30 years, and he sprays on a, a lacquer finish, but not in a heavy commercial one-time heavy. He puts on seven or eight micro coats and rubs each one out, which means he's taking 90% of the finish off each time he puts it on, and it builds this most beautiful gentle finish that's also quite strong to resist things. That's the best I've come up with over the years. The piece here that I'll encourage you to come up and take a look at afterwards, I brought one in for sort of audience participation. That's just got a couple of coats of hand rubbed oil and a tiny bit of wax melted in it. But that's not going to have wine glasses on it and things like that. What sort of oils? Uh, the oils I use are, um, Tell you the truth, I haven't really oiled a piece until this for a long time. There, there was a famous woodworker who all of us admired who died a few years ago, and he came up with a finish called 123, which is spar varnish and mineral oil and beeswax. That's an exquisite finish. It's not a very tough finish, but it's exquisite. But it would go on a piece like this. I, I'm happy to answer any more of your technical questions like that, either at the end of this or, or maybe after, but I'm, I'm a little worried about time. Maybe. No, we have time. Okay. We're good for now. And the other reason I'm a little uncomfortable asking you questions, I don't really finish anymore. I did for years, but it's it's a chemical in the shop I don't particularly want. Uh, it's really its own profession. I mean, it's like saying, well, I'm a farmer. That doesn't make you necessarily a gourmet cook or vice versa. But you can be. There are a lot of guys who do their own finishing, but I have always had a pretty big pile of commissions to get out. That's been... I've been blessed or whatever that would fortunate about that. So for me to stop and spend weeks and weeks finishing a piece, and here I'll give you an example, by the way, um, if I can do this again. Um, Matt, how come that, Let me try. that guy's not trying, trying, to go. trying to get to that menu at the top? Yeah. Oh, oh thank you. Uh, let's see. I'll show you a piece if you want to ask a question about finish. And this is called, I'll give you an overall view of the piece quickly. This is called the kimono cabinet. This is Macassar ebony, gold, 
and maple. It took 14 months to build. Uh, I, I, I hesitate to say this in front of people because I think this is all my work. This is by far the most expensive piece I made, but it was $90,000. Uh, I lost money that year because I have about half that in gold and ebony. And when I say 14 months, I don't mean three hours a day. I tend to work 16 to 18 hours a day. So that piece drained me, but I love making it. And it's in, I'll, I'll show you some more about the piece in, later if you like. But there's a detail of the handles on the piece. I like this photo quite a bit. These are Gabon ebony, not the Macassar, which has the coffee color streaks. This is pure black Gabon ebony. And the handles are gold, or the pins are gold. And the main part of the case is uh, Macassar ebony. And I had my finisher come to my studio, and it took him a month and a half to finish this. And it was $7,000 just for the finish. It, it, I said, make it look like a Ferrari. And I, I think he did a pretty good job. That, that is way over and beyond price-wise, scale-wise. But this was a very good client of mine from Microsoft. And he turned 40, and his wife said, make him whatever, anything you can think of. So I pulled out every stop I could think of, and this is what I came up with. But that finish was my friend brushing and, and, and rubbing out and brushing and rubbing out for a month and then polishing. That's the farthest I can go with it that I know of. What's the finishing process? Not necessarily the finish, but the ending of the piece. The question is when a client picks up a piece, what is the sort of finale? Oh, the last thing I do, I thought you meant the actual pickup, as in when Matt and I struggled to get his. I told Matt, Matt lives literally across the street from me. I said, Matt, delivery's going to be free for you. <laughs> uh, actually, I deliver free anywhere in the Northwest. Other than that, I ship it around the country and it's taken care of. The last thing that's done with this is just rubbed out. And again, it depends on the piece. A lot of people will, they're, I'm sure you all know what sandpaper is and that there are different grits, and the higher the number, the finer they get. Most people will finish a piece at about 150 and lacquer it and rub it out. Some of my pieces we finish at, at four, 400. And then we actually sand them with a piece of bond paper. Just right out of your printer, I take a piece of paper and we sand because even that paper has grit. When you're sanding with a piece of bond paper, you're, you're really sort of saying you might need some sunglasses. But this piece just wanted to be taken as far as it could, as it could be. So generally, it's the last coat of lacquer, rub dry, and, and let it dry. Yeah. So I had previewed that piece actually on your uh, on your web gallery, and I was, it looks like you Just have even more pictures piece. here. Yeah, yeah. I, I was really interested in the secret compartments that oh. um, were That's mentioned. And if you had a chance to go over those, I'd love to see sure. more. Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, this is the back of it, by the way. This is the part that goes against the wall. I thought. Even that was kind of pretty, but my, I have the, the drop pencil theory of things. I don't leave glue on the bottom of my pieces. My theory is who knows when someone's going to drop a piece, go down and look at it and say, oh, God, guy doesn't really finish his work. My purpose is that the back of the piece isn't that different than the front of the piece. I don't know where it's going to be seen. And I'd, I'd love the fact, I like the idea that the, the image in my mind is the person isn't going to drop the pencil the first day I deliver the piece. It's going to take 8, 10, 15 years that are going to own the piece, hope they love the piece. Maybe they're already starting to pass it down through their family. I don't think of my pieces in terms of my client. I think of them in terms of their grandsons, 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 grandsons. I, there's nothing I've built that shouldn't last hundreds of years, nothing. Um, so I, my idea is they drop the pen 20 years later, and then they look and say, wow, I'm glad we hired that guy. He really finished the <laughs> thing off. So there's the back of that piece. And I realize your question is about the secret compartment. There's one of them. Oh, what happened? Oh, there's one of them. And I'm not sure why this isn't focusing a little yeah, bit better. Will in a second. Oh, OK. So uh, again, please Matt, monitor me a little bit about time because there's, you know. there's a lot of work I haven't shown you. I'll breeze through it quicker in a minute so you don't have to group. But this has, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that drawer alone. Let me see if I can go back to the overall. Yeah, sorry. There's a little bit of an idea where that drawer comes from. That drawer you're looking at is here. There are six across there. This was Jonathan tries everything he's been too afraid to try. So these are timber fronts. Timber as in roll top, the correct term is timber. These are wooden pieces of maple 
that are on a cloth backing and they slide back into the cabinet and they're not flat. They have a, a series of waves carved into them so they sort of wave as they go by. Um, and that opens without any trouble. And then there are six drawers here and your question was what happens. Oh, the other thing that I had fun with was my original idea, although I call it the kimono cabinet, was that it was kind of like a man or a woman standing there with a set of tails on, the black tails, and sort of pulling them back in this sort of posture. And that's why the doors are pulled back like that visually, just as if the fabric was pulling back. Um, and then the two most fun things on this cabinet, besides the secret drawers, are one, the cabinet locks. The cabinet locks by, by putting a piece of wood on the cabinet. You have to know where to put it. And it's got, it's ebony and it has magnets in it. And because it's got magnets, you can store this key anywhere in your house. Just put it against the wall. Wherever there's a screw from the sheetrock, you can just hang it like a little wing sculpture. If you want to bring it back, put it on the cabinet. It pulls magnets out of the doors and they open. So the doors open up. And then I put in a delayed ramping light system. And then I, you guys all look like you know more about what I'm talking about than I do. It just come on the market. So when you open that door, nothing happens for 0.5, 0.5. In about 0.5, about a half a second, and then the light ramps up very slowly, like in a theater, and it goes from nothing to to full full blow, uh, glow in about 1.2 seconds. So it's got this: open the doors, pull the curtains back, and the lights just rise up in it. Uh, and that's really a pretty effect as well. And then there are these secret compartments, and um, there's one of them right there. This is curly maple or tiger maple or, or fiddled maple and that is impossible to cut dovetails because it throws your chisels in every direction but these are all hand dovetailed and the six drawers across the cabinet and of course they all curve they all have a belly they're not flat they're cut from the same piece of wood anytime I do a series of drawers and they're hand dovetailed the first set of dovetails have to be perfect that's what you're doing here the second set now they have to be perfect but they have to be more perfect because if you blow them you've already ruined the first set and by the time you get to the third or fourth drawer, you turn your phone off, you turn the phones off, and nobody comes in because if you just hand dovetail three or four drawers and blow the last one, you can't put another piece of wood there. So it's a little bit nerve-wracking at this point. And again, these are spalted or cur or not spalted, they're curly maple, which is ornery as can be. Um, my understanding is that quilted, like fiddles or fiddleback maple, is the result of a very, very heavy tree having a hard time with its own weight. And it actually just wrinkles under the weight of the tree, and that's why you get this beautiful look. So it's hand dovetail. And then each one of these drawers had, um, well, let's do the map, looks like nine individual compartments that has this little wooden pin latch that I carved the pin latches, and each one springs open and opens and has a keychain. The client has, I think, about 60 Ferraris. So, I, <laughs> so what are you guys laughing at? You work at Google. I'm going to make one for each of you. Uh, so each. No, no, that's you. That's you. I, I'm not a car maker. I'm a furniture maker. Uh, so a 275, whatever the heck it is, is probably something one mil mil in 1920 in Italy. I don't know. But uh, each one of those keychains has its own compartment lined in silk. Uh, there's another. Let me see if I can find this for you. There's a detail of the timbers and the drawers. Oh, that's some spalted maple. Um, your question about secret doors. So for example, you can't open this panel by pulling on it. You have to walk around behind the piece, slide a panel, which I can't tell you. If, if I tell you, I have to kill you. I'll tell you where the panel is. I did a lot of work on Gates' house, and that's actually closer to the truth. Than <laughs> you guys can't repeat this. This isn't going on the web, is it? Yeah, <laughs> um, you can't find it unless you know where it is. You slide a panel in the back, you pull a pin out, you walk back, and the front of it opens. So you don't need keys or a memory. Well, you kind of need a memory. And <clears throat> there's four others, and only three of them I can remember where they are. Uh, anyway, does that answer your question about secret? This piece was uh, as a result of the second one-man show I did, which was called Furniture That Keeps Secrets. And all the pieces of furniture had secret purposes or, or drawers or places you could access. And that was one of the, the most fun shows I ever did. And if anybody ever wants, I just finished, I believe through Matt, but a, a couple in uh, Palo Alto, 
at the Google, their Google people. Uh, I just finished building my desk. You'll see a version of it there, and it's got secret compartments in it. And they said, "Oh, we love that. Put us, put us on it." Sure. Um, let me try and get back on task, which is. So we got about ten minutes left, so we should. Okay, now I'm just going to whip through slides. Okay, let's see. I mean, first I got to get okay, escape. Um, let me click one, and I'm just going to click forward because I actually like. We're stuck. We're in cabinets here. Is this too fast? You can always call me back to a, a photo you see at any time. This piece is called homage, homage to Georgia O'Keeffe. You see the sort of dry desert images in the panel. This is spalted maple. I also did it. My third show was called One Tree, and the entire tree came from a spalted maple tree right here in Wallingford that people asked me to take down, and it was the most extraordinary piece. So I spent a month hand sawing eighth inch hand sawn veneers which is a very laborious and expensive and nice process. And I made 18 pieces from that one tree, and the show is called One Tree, which is pretty amazing. That means I'm at the end of that group, I believe. So let's go escape, back to the top, and um, should we do a quick look through dining tables? I'm going to move a lot quicker now. <coughs> Again, from the Spalted Maple Show, or the blank screen. I didn't do a blank screen show, but it looks like it. <laughs> Help, Mr. Wizard. Here we go. Detail the Spalted Maple. Again, you see the hard rock uh, solid maple and the aprons and the legs for strength. The Spalted Maple is very fragile. There's a detail of a shot I called the Nuevo Cabriol Table, the new, new Cabriol Table. The traditional Cabriol Table leg I find extremely unattractive, but Cabriol comes from the word cabra, which is goat. And the definition of cabriol, as in the Volkswagen cabriolet, um, is the shape of a goat's leg as it's scampering across a meadow. I love English. Really? It can't be walking or trotting. It has to be scampering across the meadow. That's where cabriol comes from. And that's my version. And I took out all the horizontal strength members called aprons or stretchers. You'll see none of them between the legs. I cast my own pieces of bronze, and so there's no... There's no stockings getting ripped or knees getting whacked. It's an apronless table. This is a um, this is a fun piece. This is uh, in fact I think Matt said this one out in the flyer. This is called the octavo table. O octavo is a Spanish ordinal for eight or eighth, and it has eight pieces. This is a piece that metamorphizes from that in its closed position to that in its open position. And I love the math and the geometry in this. This table seats four comfortably. Not really room for more than four. There are four leaves hanging on the wall in a sculpture rather than a closet getting dusty. And when you put them in, the table now seats 10 comfortably. And I've always loved math, in part particular geometry. I still can't figure this table out. <laughs> it's a lot of work, but that's the octavo table. That's probably my most built piece. It's a, it's a uh, trestle table, unbelievably versatile in what you can do with a table like this. It's got ebony wedges, so you can take it down and ship it or move it away for a dance party. Um, in fact, Matt, I think you have this, don't you? Yeah. It's just a very simple, I think, elegant and so completely functional table. And strangely, it's one of the least expensive pieces I make. It's, it's pretty simple. Um, conference table in Imbuya for the east side. Let's go back to... Dining tables, desks. We'll do a quick thing about desks. This is the the original version of the piece I just shipped to your colleague in Palo Alto. Hi, Heska. Um, this is in Bubinga, the wood I like so much, and it's called the Tiger Desk. This one also has six secret drawers in it. Um, I won't explain them all to you, but for example, this one here, the top one, it's got a pin. It's got a groove in a pattern routed to the bottom of it. And the divider here, which looks like a drawer divider, in this, these are all fixed. This one's not. It's actually glued beside the drawer. And you can't pull the drawer out. You actually have to push it back away from you, which is counterintuitive. Slide it to one side, pull it back to the front, slide it back to its original position, and now it comes out. And I, I just think things like that are fun. <laughs> I mean, uh, so there, that was part of uh, furniture that keeps secrets. This is a reception desk for a law firm. He said, I'm sorry, these got a little out of order there. Of course, there's the tiger desk again. 
and I'm going to admit something. Most people think it's called the tiger desk because the striped wood. It's actually embarrassingly the shape of the legs. There's a track shoe called Onitsuka Tiger Track Shoes, and that's kind of their logo. <laughs> and I, when I designed this, I thought, but don't don't tell anybody. <laughs> so given we have a short amount of time left, let's make sure we have time for any last questions. Yeah, please ask questions as we go. I'm just going to really flip through these. These are some older pieces. This is the Piet Mondrian desk with the different black lines and panels. There's your spalted maple again. There's a desk that's built on a lot of geometric progressions for a collector in Seattle. And I think I can whip through the two categories. I hope this, you said I had plenty of time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't count on me, did you? Uh, Okay, sideboards, seating, beds, and let's do these really. Sideboards, which is a, a pretty useful piece. This is probably the closest to what I would consider your piece, Matt. On the uh, one of the cabrio like desks, uh, what was the foot pad? The foot pad? You had a, a maple, <coughs> a maple <coughs> leg with a very dark pad on the very bottom of the foot. Oh, I know which piece you're talking about. That was as close to, I don't even know the terms. Historically, I really don't spend much time on what's happened, but that was supposed to be, it's, so it's an Imbuya desk, golden brown, and it's got a black wenge foot to it, and then I inlaid a white holly round dot in it. Is that the piece? That no, wasn't the piece. Uh, oh. It was literally like a, a three-sixteenth th three of an inch. Of black? Of black. Uh, I'm not quite sure. I almost never do that. It's a kind of a fragile place to add such a little piece of wood. What you might often be seeing is I tend to bevel the legs. I like everything to look like it's floating on a shadow. Okay. I don't like straight lines hitting the floor in a easily discernible connection. <coughs> I like it a little more mystical and floating. So it's, it's very possible that's a shadow line. I work with shadow lines a lot. Um, you know, instead of going through individual pieces, maybe this is even more fun to do it this way. Um, you see the I called the Andy Warhol piece, the architect commissioned this one with the lips. No, I'm sorry, we called it Mick, as in Mick Jagger. Um, this is a piece that's um, becoming very trendy right now, which is called Wayne Edge or Natural Ed Boards and Furniture. It actually belongs, the, the genesis of it, the whole creative, belongs to a furniture maker who died some years ago named George Nakashima, who was originally from Seattle, and he was very into these organic boards. Now every banana head with a chainsaw is slabbing their trees in the backyard, sticking four metal pipes on it and saying, I'm an artist. Uh, it's a little frustrating. I think when you use those natural edges of trees, settling in in the right places, it's extraordinarily pretty. It's just a matter of knowing when to stop. But this is an early piece I did with that, that same thing. There's the detail of the drug. And by the way, if we go back real quickly, oh, <coughs> you'll notice that the, the figure, the figure. People talk about wood having pretty grain. Wood does not have pretty grain. It has closed grain, and open grain. It has pretty figure. Even woodworkers make the mistake. So the figure in this drawer, which is the look of it, you'll notice it runs all throughout all four drawers. And if you remember what I said earlier, by the time you get to the fourth drawer, you better be pretty focused because if you blow that one, um, it's no good. Let me get you a couple more pictures. Please, starting with any questions you have. I don't do a lot of seating just because it is so expensive. It's I can make a dining table handmade, book match, wood's, wood's been stored and aged for 15 years. I can make it for almost the same price as a furniture store. Sometimes I can make it cheaper. And if you buy a $4,000 or $2,000 dining table for me, it's $2,000 worth of work in wood. You buy a $2,000 piece of furniture from a commercial enterprise, there's at least three middlemen in that. That table probably costs hundred to hundred and fifty dollars to make and so I don't get why you would not make buy a handmade piece of furniture You're, it's all value and individual chairs are different chairs because the relative um, uniformity of human bodies and scale they can be um, standardized to some extent and so they can make chairs way cheaper than a handmade chair maker but I don't think they can make a chair like that or a piece of seating like that that's actually uh, East Indian rosewood and silk Oh, let's get out of here, escape, and go back. Seating, we'll do a little bit of beds miscellaneous. There again is the spalted maple from that show with a black ebony sort of stringer strengthener detail. 
And again, for me, the, the biggest thing in designing and, and sort of relating, or let's say interacting with a piece of furniture, it's really light. You don't see the piece if there's not light on it. And so what I try and do is bend light. Whenever I have a curved element, I put a bevel on it so that bevel just bends with it, shows off the light. And when I when I you see the bevels here, it's all about highlighting the piece in the shadows. Um, that's kind of what I'm for here. After here, there's the there's a detail of a staircase I built for my house in cherry and ebony. There's the cheap Haitian ebony carving for the handles. There's a moose I have to ship this afternoon back to my niece. <laughs> my my older brother's six foot eight. When his son was born, we thought he's going to be big. He's not, but <laughs> I mean, in fact, maybe Theo could. You? Uh, whew, let's, let's get out of that quickly. That's me when I was 23 and apprenticing. Um, I don't think, unless you guys have specific questions about any piece, like your question about the drawers or about certain pieces, I'm very happy to talk about a certain piece. I'm a little worried about my skill at pulling those pictures up that quickly. So, But uh, it sounds like we have five or ten minutes left, and if there's any other questions or you'd like to see a second piece again. Um, We're gonna, he's going to hang out for lunch, too. Yeah, feel free to feel, bring me a brownie and ask a question. Uh, yeah. Maybe one last question and then we'll wrap it up. Thanks. What's your feeling on uh, CNC machines in the realm of fine woodworking? Do they have a place? You guys sitting down, I'm carefully measuring this response. <laughs> Uh, look, I mean, I'm a furniture maker. I make things. I think that's the simplest and, and I think most flattering term that I could hear used from me is someone who makes things. I just built the house. I did the plumbing. I did the wiring. I did the copper roof. I blow glass. I weave. I, it's all the same thing. You see things and you want to make them. I am a maker, and I'm really proud of that, actually. Um, that's not what people in my family have traditionally done, but okay. So anything that helps you make things, to me, is fair game. I have a shop full of tools. If any of you guys are the slightest bit techie, come by and visit our neighborhood, and I'll to show you my studio. It's hand planes, as far as you can see, and German chisels, which I cut the cheap handles off and put ebony and bronze in. I work with tools. My, my way of looking at my work is solving problems. In fact, if this isn't too pretentious, I think my way of resolving problems is kind of binary, and I'm on, on thin ice here with you guys, but I believe binary it comes from the by word is a root of two. You've got two choices. You guys use O's and ones, right? Yeses or no's. When I design, I don't I don't design something say it should be this way. I'm gonna make a desk for Matt's son for high school graduation. Should it be this high? No, that's too tall too tall. Should I lower it down here? No, that's too low. You you keep going with the no's until you get a yes. Isn't that the way a computer works? I think it is. And that's design. It's just reacting and, and, and seeing the look of it. And to get that look I want, I use my tools. Tools are obviously hand planes and chisels and table saws and, and measuring tapes and all those things. But tools are also, and the CNC router is close to those. Tools are also a lot more esoteric than just a piece of metal that shapes something. But a CNC router is a very um, cool magical machine that can help you make things. In my work, I would say every single thing you've seen here has got whatever amount of hours in it, the amount of hours that there was a machine or a motor or electricity or something making noise, it's probably 5%. Almost everything is, is sawn by hand. Everything is hand planed. I, I rarely use sandpaper. I find it very coarse and grindy and abrasive, literally and you're crushing the wood, whereas an extremely sharp hand plane slices and lifts the wood and cleans it and, and makes it brilliant. So I don't tend to use a lot of machines. It's just not the nature of my work, and it's not very satisfying. And if I was after precision, and some people are, I'd get a CNC router. I'm not after precision. I, I, I can't even tell you there's a certain detail in any of these pieces in my work that's the same measurement on one side or the other. I really couldn't care less. Do you remember that term I used at the beginning, the WTP factor? I'm not interested in an engineer coming over from, from Brussels or something, putting a tape and saying, Franz is incredible. It's exactly 132 millimeters. I'm, I'm interested in someone coming and saying, well, I don't even get what this is. 
But there's that factor again, that WTU. If, if it doesn't resonate with you, if it doesn't speak to you, if it doesn't give you some kind of visceral response, I don't think I've done my job. And the CNC router is, is purely about precision. And that's just not an issue for me. So I think they're great tools. If someone wants to gift me one or let me play with it, I'll take it. But it just doesn't really line up with my work that much. That's all I can tell you. I think that's a good way of wrapping this up. So thank you very much, John. Thank <laughs> you.